John Nadiger, good morning. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, looking forward to the conversation with you around uh, the, uh, the work you're doing to upskill um, your community uh, in uh, data analytics and artificial intelligence. You've had some success uh, working at Carroll University. So we'd certainly like to hear a little bit about what you're doing over there. Um, John, tell us a little bit about your current role at Carroll University, um, how you moved into that role from industry and what you're hoping to accomplish. So um, I, I, I do come from industry, so I'm not a normal path to um, education. Uh, I've spent my last 27 years with Johnson Controls before I came to the university with my wife. My wife is the president here, and I had all, every intention of just being uh, retired. But uh, they, they sucked me into being uh, uh, teaching in the uh, management and leadership side of the School of Business. Um, and then as we were reimagining our curriculum, we really realized that analytics is going to be uh, very, very strong. And we created the uh, position for me as the director for the Analytics and Business Intelligence Consortium, which allows us to partner with local companies, faculty, students, staff, uh, and, and really create good experiential learning opportunities for our students in, in applied business analytics. Our focus is not data science per se, it's really around creating uh, business analysts. So your, your program uh, is not purely an academic endeavor, it's a consortium with industry? It, it's it, Obviously it is also academic as well, so we, in reimagining the curriculum we created a um, the um, a, an analytics minor was our first thing that we created and it's really based upon um, I found two courses that we teach here at, at, at Carroll that was created about 12, 14 years ago off of an NSF grant. Uh, it was called Computational Thinking One and Computational Thinking Two. It wasn't very creative in the in the naming convention, but um, it they they really taught uh, the very early basis of statistics and um, to. Uh, um, kind of get them thinking about uh, spreadsheets, moving data, cleaning data, uh, using R, using Python, and it, it really gave them a, the first sense, and every student at Carroll University goes through this, and it was a perfect uh, lead, lead into our analytics minor that, that can be applied to any one of our business degrees that, that we have here at Carroll. Um, then we kind of shifted our focus towards our MBA, as as you probably are aware, most traditional MBAs are not uh, as popular as they used to be. And so we, we created two new focuses. One of them was for business analytics, obviously. And the second one was around healthcare administration, which we are a, a, a healthcare institution that does a lot for uh, nursing, uh, PA, PT, uh, the, all the different allied healthcare kind of uh, degrees that we have. And so this was just kind of a natural progression for our MBA to be able to do that as well. So, uh, John, those two uh, initial classes you mentioned are required for all students at Carroll University? They are required for all students at Carroll University. It really brings kind of a, a data awareness uh, to all of our students, something that they're, they're going to need throughout all their, their careers to be able to understand where you get data, how you use data, how you clean up data for that matter. So definitely some things that you got to consider. Um, and then how do you tell a story around it? Uh, and, and that's probably one of the harder things to teach people. Um, so as you came in and looked at this program, did you find it that you had to add to those initial, those initial two classes? Any what we did was we- uh, we data or in, in uh, uh, storytelling, in statistics and mathematics or coding? So what we did was we took the second course and we made a, a, a cross-sectional course of BUS 114. So it, it became one of our courses that we particularly teach. And we are, are uh, we start actually also adding visualization. So we uh, use Tableau in it uh, and um, kind of a little bit more data wrangling in that particular course. Uh, so we did have to make some minor changes to those particular ones. The NSF grant, uh, ran out of money, but it actually had a four core section to it. Uh, so we're just now, our uh, basically our analytics minor is actually just completing what that original work was for that NSF grant that, that we had. Okay, 
Um, from an industry perspective, um, what feedback did you get from industry on so industry is is very very and then how you 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 further evolved it and developed it? Yeah, so um, we we had been consulting industry all along about what they were needing in the way of our students. Uh, the consortium just allows me to be able to talk to each one of these uh, partner companies um, and, and really dive down into um, the skill sets that they were particularly needing. And then that's what was allowed us to be able to, to align these courses to, to meet those specific needs. Then, you know, the next thing that really comes to that is, is who, you know, you got to hire faculty to, that actually has these skill sets as well, um, which you're already aware of. Uh, so this is uh, so we hired on two new faculty. We had already had one that was more um, kind of a, from an economics background, but the econometrics is is, is so tangentially uh, uh, connected to analytics or business analytics for sure that he he was just a natural fit into this particular program. So we have three full time faculty that teach a analytics for for the uh, school. Um, so it, it was really a great find for the ones that we did find. The, the, the industries that you're targeting, that you're partnering with um, in, in, in your regional economy, are they uh, focused on a particular industry like manufacturing or high tech? Are they large companies, medium sized companies? How are you engaging that, that community? So it's a, it's a wide range of different types of businesses that we actually deal with. We, um, initially when I came into it, I really thought I was gonna be dealing with a lot of mid-sized companies, people that didn't have a complete um, analytics shop already set up on them. Your larger companies typically do. But you know, getting into this, I found out that almost everybody still needs the actual uh, workforce. Um, so uh, uh, while I'm doing more project work with smaller companies, I am placing internships in all company sizes. Uh, some of the larger ones here in uh, Wisconsin. Now Wisconsin is extremely heavily manufacturing based. So the, the, a lot of the mid-sized companies and ones that I'm actually doing project work with are the manufacturing companies. Um, so, you know, multiple different sizes of the different companies. So. Um, uh, it, it, it kind of broadened out pretty quickly from my original assessment, which would have been just mid-sized companies uh, to be able to do it. But I'm also, some of my partner companies are some of the larger ones here in the particular area, Johnson Controls, Rockwell, uh, Northwestern Mutual, Baird, are, are still very, very large companies that, that work with me on those particular kind of uh, projects. So, or mostly just placing interns. They, they really enjoy me getting them their next level of workforce. Um, if you take a look at those companies, um, there's there's entry level staff. You know they're always looking to hire the, the next generation of, of graduates. But there's also a large segment of mid career professionals at these companies. Um, what level of interest have you seen at both tiers? Um, in these companies? Are they coming to you and asking for upskilling of the mid-career professionals or are they primarily interested in bringing in the, the next generation of engineers who are uh, data uh, ready to come in and, and make a difference in, you know, in, in the company? So um, definitely on the upskilling they're looking for that and we've done some that where they were very very specific about what they wanted to, to do and so we just created a course, kind of work with, directly with them and had a, a professor sit with them for multiple weeks and, and actually do that particular type of training. Uh, one in particular that I can think of was with a healthcare organization here in Wisconsin where they wanted the clinicians to also work directly with the office staff um, that needed to be able to work. That They both had different types of ways to talk about data and they didn't really match. And so they wanted to bring them together in a room and train them all together to where they could communicate about where to get data, how to get data and how to use it. And so that was just one example of a direct uh, training. And then what I've created uh, uh, is another thing that's kind of an online upskilling for data analytics. It's a uh, credential uh, that, that leaves you with a badge that you can put on LinkedIn or on your resume uh, and it's a 14-week course that uh, starts with data 
kind of data uh, wrangling uh, using uh, Microsoft Excel because uh, that's the tool most people have data in when they originally get started with this. Um, and then we, the second part of the course is a, a more of a visualization course using Tableau. You both get uh, industry credentials for those two, two particular packages, but you also get a Carroll University uh, credential or a, and a badge. So it, it, it allows you to, to kind of post the, what, what you've been able to accomplish, and that's an upskill in the very uh, early on sense of business analytics. If you want to take it any further, then we, you know, we'd have to pull you into more of a degree program. We're even thinking about breaking apart components of the, the um, classes that we have in our MBA analytics classes into multiple credentials. So you can kind of keep moving in that particular direction, but not have to come back for a full degree. So we're in the process of doing that particular work right now. And I just added a new set of 14 courses that are more related to um, geospatial uh, analytics um, using ArcGIS. And so that, that's, a, that's a new uh, coursework that I've actually created as well. Wow, wow, interesting. Um, there's, there's a perception um, in industry that data science, data analytics uh, is uh, very technical. And, uh, and at a certain level it can be, right? Uh, where you need the PhD, the data scientist, the astrophysicist to come in and, and develop a really advanced uh, set of, of analytics. Um, how have you found industry uh, being receptive to uh, the idea that, that data analytics is, is not rocket science? That it's something that, uh, that most people can, can invest a little bit of time in and become proficient at and, and add value to, to their companies. Yeah, and, and that is the, the misnomer of, of most people. They think they instantly kind of race to data scientists, people who have a PhD and, and they have, you know, they can talk all day long and you don't understand a word that they say. But in all reality, it is multiple levels, uh, anywhere from the very uh, somebody who uses a pivot table in Excel and then moves all the way up into being a data scientist. And it's really different skill sets. Typically, data scientists or engineers, uh, computer scientists, uh, those particular types of trades. When I need those types of students, I will go into either the actuarial scientist, the, the computer scientist, math students, and uh, I'll, I'll get a higher, a higher level of, of understanding of those particular uh, areas of analytics uh, for just your business analysts and that's almost everybody who has to handle data in, in any business is truly an analyst already they just you know they haven't applied any statistical uh, analytics to it and that's what we're trying to teach them is how do you how do you add that particular component of it so where you understand the data better um, uh, do, do you have any data on the return to the individual Right, the return on the investment. Right, is um, have you seen uh, you know enhanced career opportunities for individuals that go through a, a certificate or a minor, uh, or improvement in hiring, improvement in initial salary offers um, once these individuals finish these programs. Um, for the ones that have gone through the actual the the, the minor, adding it to their degree or through the MBA. That is definitely uh, the the three that just went through this last semester for the the MBA. They immediately got offered jobs. Um, they were students who went from undergraduate directly into MBA, and then they took that that particular focus and they immediately were offered jobs. It's a little bit harder to say on the analytics minor uh, yet, but uh, th what what happens is the attention that that happens on your resume all these programs they have nowadays to sit there and filter uh, the, the resumes to look for particular keywords and, and types of skill sets that these students have. I, I, I don't, it's more anecdotal right now, but I, I fully believe that they will, they will shine out over other students just for the, for the sake of having these particular types of skill sets. So uh, a, a, it's a little bit too early, but I'm hoping to see, uh, especially in the salary area, 
and then the upscaling is again is still a little bit too early but I, I, I fully feel that that's going to also bear out as well um, just give me a give me another year <laughs> yeah. um, what sort of community support have you have you had either from local nonprofits uh, local government any any incentives uh, any programs in the community that uh, that help Carroll University attract students or uh, attract companies to your consortium? The, uh, from um, government, uh, there's been no direct support other than they, they use our services. So uh, they uh, come to us for upskilling of their particular employees um, and, and they also come to us with projects. So that, that's been really good partnership with them. In fact, I have a meeting with a local municipality here on Friday where they're looking to, for us to help them with some data sets that they need to acquire, how to use it and how to do analytics across it and then even apply it more for a geospatial analytics um, kind of projects. And th this is a, they are part of an overall, um, we, we live here in Waukesha County, Wisconsin, and there's a, what's called the Waukesha County Business Alliance. And they are the ones who have uh, 14 of the municipalities right here in this county all in that particular consortium, they're coming over for a lunch and learn to really go over the, exactly what this first municipality is asking us about. Where do we get our data? How do we um, how do we wrangle the data? And then how do we apply it to where we can make economic decisions for our particular community? And so that that's really been exciting to see them try to start to apply that data in a way that they can make. Um, true impact for their their local communities and these are small municipalities they're not really really big but you know they got the main street and they got the new development in that area and, and they want to try to figure out what's next what sort of projects are, are they coming to you with is it revenue is, is it taxation for example is it financial taxation revenue revenue generation or is it a little more different is it infrastructure wise or is it in analyzing uh, citizen requests and citizen information? What sort of projects are they coming to you with that require this level of data analysis? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because it's almost all of the above. So we've had, you know, COVID-19 with, you know, dashboards and things like that, we've had requests for um, and, and created and helped them create their, their particular uh, end user facing uh, dashboards. And then smaller projects where that you would actually be doing studies of um, traffic patterns and, and things like that, the data that they're, they're pulling and trying to determine. Um, I had one project, they were kind of toying with the opportunity to be able to hook up to Waze. Waze has uh, the, app, the phone app that actually has an API in it to be able to, to track people moving through a particular neighborhood. They were concerned about speed. So, the, the, you know, Waze has speed, how, you know, the traffic patterns of people. So you don't, you don't know who it is, but you can sit there and, and track and say, okay, there's this many people going through this neighborhood and they're going more than 25 miles per hour. And, you know, should we put a speed bump in? And so that, that was a particular project they were bringing to me. I haven't, I haven't got them to kind of bite on it yet, but that one, that one was kind of fun. Um, larger companies, I, I just did a, a place an intern with a large manufacturer here where they were looking to do some machine learning on, uh, they acquired a new company that th does energy monitoring of the grid and they wanted to match that against uh, some of the equipment that they're putting out there in, in, in areas of the United States. I'm not going to name names, but uh, it was uh, um, clearly a company that uh, had some brand new people uh, and they needed to upskill, but then I placed an intern over there and he really shined. He started January 5th and he got offered a job March 1st. Wow. So, you know, he clearly impressed them. Uh, and now I gotta find another intern to place over there. <laughs> success okay. begets success, I guess. Yeah, that, that, that Waze example uh, is intriguing because um, the, the ability to do analytics is really dependent on the ability to find good data. Um, so the fact that somebody thought of ways and knew that that Google app, it's, it's for, for those listeners that aren't familiar with Ways, W-A-Z-E, it is the equivalent of, of Google Maps. 
Um, it's a Google-owned app, similar to Google Maps that people can use. But one of the things that it, that it has done is it makes a lot of the data available publicly to municipalities. So the fact that somebody at the municipality actually had the idea of looking at Waze data to see how quickly people were driving through a neighborhood, uh, to me, that, that, that's really interesting. Somebody at that, at that government agency was being very creative because that's not... Actually, I, I brought that to the public. I brought that idea to them because oh, they didn't know. They, they, they were trying to figure out if they put down the little strips and, and do the, the monitoring. And I was like going, Waze already has a lot of this data for you and it's 24-7 real time. You don't have to put anything down and just track it for six months, a year, or ever how long you want to do it, and then see what actually you get out of it. Because a lot of people do use Waze, and so if you can get to that data through their API, great, pull it. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, so uh, for municipalities, I guess one of the initial challenges is gonna be, uh, it's not so much what is the problem I'm trying to solve, it's also where is the data that might help me solve that problem, because if you, if you don't know where to where to get the data, um, you you really won't have the ability to do the analysis you need to solve the problem. The the other concern that a lot for these smaller municipalities or counties is the data is actually in twenty seven spreadsheets in in twenty seven departments, and they don't have any master data that they're trying to particularly control. So uh, um, that's one of the the first things first that they need to really get a handle on is what is the the true the, the 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 source of truth as I call it of data and so somebody's got to be able to start pulling this together to where they can control it um, and then use it properly to, to create the analytics or the visualizations what are they're trying to do with it from from the student perspective John um, there's lots of students um, that come into your university and don't even consider the analytics side, the, the opportunities. Um, they come in with the perception of, oh, I'm not good at math, or I'm not an analytics person, or uh, the perception of it's not interesting, it's boring, it's a dry field, and it's not something that I would have fun at. Um, how, how have you been able to generate interest amongst the student body? Um, it's it's, kind of it's really interesting. Have you seen gravitate towards this and really are successful and get engaged and get excited about this? So, uh, for most people, if they don't have any, any experience with analytics, those computational thinking courses um, is kind of like this little known secret that we have. Once they take those courses and they're successful in it, I, I mentioned to them, said, you've already been through some really basic analytics courses already. You've already got the basis for them. You, 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 you went through the course, you passed the course. We're just gonna build upon that particular thing. The other thing I tell students when I, when I get a chance to talk to them or get in front of them in, in a class is when I first started the consortium um, three years ago, I, I always do LinkedIn searches uh, you know, periodically to, to look for internships for my students, but uh, look for analytics in the title of the particular job and I just searched Greater Milwaukee Area. When I first started, there were 600 open jobs. The students' eyes get real big real quick. And I say, they're well-paying jobs. Then they get bigger. <laughs> and then I mentioned the two years after that, there was 2,000 open jobs. I, I haven't checked it recently, and I should have probably checked it before I got on this podcast, but it is just an amazing am uh, amount of open opportunities that are out there, and people are scrambling for them. And anytime you have a marketplace like that, that means the salaries are gonna go up. Uh, and, and the students seem to get really excited about that. And that's just adding an analytics minor, let alone go at it as an analytics major, which is our next thing to add. And students are actually looking for it. I've got a student that was going to another school, found out that we had an analytics minor and getting ready to make a major, and he's switching schools. So that, you know, that, that's less anecdotal now. It's, it's actually created an opportunity for students to come here. The, the, um, the spread of opportunity in analytics um, is very likely across all industries in, in your area. Um, or are there certain industries, uh, certain focus areas where, where you see more of an interest in analytics? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit biased here because I'm only in the, say, the Milwaukee area, heavy manufacturing and things like that, but it is across the board. So it's, you know, government, it's uh, higher education, even uh, all your enrollment management uh, people. I've, I've already sent three or four of, of the enrollment uh, management uh, recruiters uh, through the, the, our analytics boot camp uh, here at Carroll University because they were so interested in being able to analyze the data and mapping it out. Um, but you know, so uh, manufacturing is huge for us. Healthcare, uh, very very big for for us in this particular community. Um, so that's um, just a wide swath. Financial, uh, insurance. Uh, we got some very large, you know, Northwestern Mutual, American Family, are are up here, um, and they're constantly looking for analytics uh, or business analysts. Uh, for that particular one. They also have a really strong need for uh, actuarial science, which uh, tangentially is very, very strong analytics wise. So I, I like to try to steal those from the other departments, but you know, that they have another goal to get a, uh, an actuarial science degree, but if I can derail them, I will. <laughs> They're great students. Outstanding, outstanding. Um, so uh, John, so looking forward, Right, uh, the, next, the next couple of years. Um, what, what do you see as, 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 your, as your main opportunities for, for your program and for your consortium? So the consortium itself is uh, set up, we got about 200 member companies at the, at the moment. Um, I'd like to grow that, um, probably double that in size. Um, we're getting ready to build a School of Business and Technology building, which will have a much larger um, auditorium space for some of our events. Now, COVID-19 has really changed that. Um, so th now we're doing more meetings that are both in-person and, and, and uh, hybrid to where people online, but that means I can actually reach people who are outside of the range of Carroll University's, you know, say 25, 30 minute drive. People who are alumni that, that live in California can watch it at the same time as well. So as we move forward, I want to really do more programming that people can come and feel comfortable with um, analytics and even some of the other components, more the soft skills. Um, I'm, uh, I've got an upcoming uh, uh, meeting that we're going to do about data storytelling. So now it's not really about the hard skills. It's about, okay, how do you understand the data? How do you present that data to somebody who is not a data scientist? Um, and, and those skills are a little bit harder to teach. But that's also an area that we want, we have to have for our analytics major. Uh, so that's a, even a coursework that we're trying to work on. Um, so to, for me, I, I'm just trying to grow it and get more people aware of Carroll University here in the state of Wisconsin, in the region, nationally. Um, I always say that we're the best kept secret and I don't want it to be a secret anymore. Yeah, outstanding. Um, the, the consortium. Um, you, you, you mentioned that you, that you want to double the size of the consortium. Um, what does that look like operationally? Are they members of, of a formal organization? Are there monthly dues? Is it an informal structure where people communicate and collaborate and share ideas? Um, what does that look like? So right now it's, it's, a, it's kind of a closed membership. They, uh, they do pay yearly membership fees. Most of that is really to help pay for speakers, for uh, food at the events or anything like that. We also allow sponsorships from vendors uh, and larger companies who want to uh, pay sponsorships that um, help pay for, like that when we do our yearly conference, some of these speakers can be pretty expensive, like a futurist or somebody like that. Th that's a pretty big chunk of change that you need to be able to cover. What they get out of it is through the sponsorship that they can actually speak at the conference they get their logos over all, on everything and showing that they're sponsoring this, that they're involved. Um, so definitely um, uh, a way for people to be involved, whatever level that you want to be at. And this can, the students get to be members for free. Um, uh, after that, then it's, you know, if somebody is a retired person and still wants to be involved, they can be a member at a very low rate. And then it lar the larger the company, the more people that you might invite the larger the fee that it is for the support of the organization. So, so the students are members also, and they're able to attend sessions and, and, and uh, network and get to know the, the employers who are members and potentially 
handshake and get to know each other for uh, future internships or job opportunities. And, and that's the ben, one of the benefits that I, I sell both sides. So I tell the students, guess what? These are the people who are hiring. You want to meet these people. Then I tell the people who are hiring, hey, you want to go meet them early on in the pipeline before somebody else gets them. And then you meet them at these events and get to get, get to know them in almost like a, a soft interview. So it, it's definitely a, a great opportunity for everybody. Excellent. Excellent. COVID-19 slowed that down, but uh, it, when these vaccines get kind of moving, I'm hoping that we're going to be back at it uh, in the fall. Um, okay, excellent. So uh, to finish off, is, is there any one project that, that you've had recently with, with a member firm that, that you think just truly demonstrates, you know, the, the opportunity and the power of having these, these kids come into a company and uh, start off a project and do something amazing that the company really didn't think was doable so quickly or so easily? A couple of them. I, I mentioned earlier about that manufacturer who wanted to do some machine learning and the, the student was able to walk in there and actually um, set some of that up and then also do some visualization work with them in Tableau where departments who generally were not comfortable with the data were, he was able to do visualizations that made them comfortable understanding the particular data and actually made a lot of friends uh, that the IT department was struggling with. It was, it was quite interesting on that one. Had another project with a, another manufacturing company. This this company does some um, sells and supports lubricants for large rotating equipment. So they also do the testing for the lubricants for any contaminants in it. They came to me for with a project where they needed to test a new machine, a spectroscopy machine that could actually do it in real time at the site, as opposed to someone having to go out sample, bring it back to a very expensive lab. So I put a chemistry major in there computer science major and a uh, business major, and they actually did a whole project to do the ROI of using this particular device, testing it against data that they already had from samples from other sites uh, that already been lab tested. Can the spectroscopy, I can't, it's very hard to say spectroscopy, but that particular machine is um, was found to be very, very accurate in being able to find the particular contaminants that they were able to find in the lab. And so it, um, the ROI on it would, they're still kind of working on how, how you take it to market, but the students were able to verify what they needed to do um, uh, to go forward with an actual business plan. The business person was there more for project management and actually did the, the final presentation to the customer. I was there for that particular presentation. The students did great. Um, they were very impressed. In fact, they hired two of them to continue on as an intern to keep on testing the way they were doing to kind of finalize this product and roll it out. So great success story where the students really shined, shined well for that particular customer. So, so one of the fears of, of, of many students, <coughs> um, so, so one of the fears of many students when they start a career is that they'll go into a company and they'll be stuck in a corner, they'll have a boring job, and they're gonna be there for five or 10 years before they ever have an opportunity to make a difference. Uh, it sounds like um, this is an opportunity to learn a skill that is lacking in most companies, come in and make a difference, have an impact, make a name for yourself very, very quickly, um, as opposed to the old school way of getting a general degree going in and having you know a, a regular job and being one of the many uh, you know, minions or, or you know, the, 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 the perception is that you'll be one of the many, right? And you might be forgotten. Uh, but it sounds like this is, a, this is really a way to, to differentiate, make, you know, come in and, 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 and make some impact and make a difference and get noticed. It, it definitely, just from what I've seen, and, and I try to be involved with as many of these kind of presentations as possible, just so I know how the company is perceiving to what's going on. The, the example earlier where the student went over there, started January 5th and, as an intern and got offered a full-time job um, two, you know, two months later is to testament to me that you, know, you can shine quite nicely. He wasn't even planning on working for that company. He had another company in mind that he was gonna go target, but they offered him such a good job and at a good salary. He was like going, okay, yeah, I can do this. Uh, you know, money talks. Yeah, perfect, perfect, perfect. 
Okay, uh, John, so uh, to finish off, uh, a couple of quick questions for you that you know can serve as advice or, or counsel to the next generation of, of, of uh, students that are entering the workforce. Um, your first job uh, in industry, right? Your, your first job uh, as, as a young man, um, that, uh, that's not on your LinkedIn profile, right? Um, what, uh, what was that job? What lessons did you get from that? Um, that that you pulled into your career. What's interesting is one of my first jobs. But, but this was back in high school and college. Early, I was I worked for a nursery, of all things, not very technical, but you know, I, I, what I actually learned a lot about was uh, management skills because I was one of the assistant managers. I, I was um, sales skills, so I sold products. I helped design. And things like that. I, 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 it helped me understand business quite well from top to bottom. Um, you know how to close out the books, how to um, wh how do you plan for the next year, where do you get your inventory, and things like that. And this, you know, it, it is not on my resume, but it really taught me a lot of both about how to be a good manager and what not to do. Um, a lot of what you taught. In, in my career advice for anybody. Um, who is in school is internship, 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 in, and I, I'll say it 27 times. It's what launched my whole career because my first internship was with IBM. I ended up staying there for three years and it launched my techni technical career in, in a particular trajectory that I could have never understood at that time, but I do today. Outstanding. Um, so John, uh, for the listeners on, on, on the show, um, if they want to get a hold of you, if they want to get uh, to learn more about you, um, what's the best way for folks to reach out and, and engage with you? A couple ways. I mean, obviously, if you come to Carroll University's website, you'll find the Analytics and Business Intelligence Consortium. You can reach out to me there. Um, catch me on LinkedIn. Um, there's not too many Nattingers out there with a name spelled like mine, so that that's you, you'll find me very very quickly. Uh, reach out to me there. A lot of my members of the consortium reach out through that particular way. There's also an, uh, an analytics and business intelligence consortium LinkedIn site as well, where I post a lot for members and prospective members about upcoming opportunities. Uh, even if you're a non-member and you want to attend some of the events, I don't charge a lot of money. You know, they're like 25 bucks to attend. Come on in there and see what it's like and see if it's something that you'd want to be involved with or looking for a model for uh, your school. Outstanding. And for the listeners out there, uh, your last name is spelled with a G. G N A D I N G E R. It's in German, it's Gnadinger, which means most gracious. Uh, I just say Nadinger here in the United States. So we we kind of toned it down when we got here. Outstanding. So, uh, John Nadinger, uh, Carroll University, Director of Business um, Intelligence. Uh, managing a consortium of companies in the uh, Wisconsin area. Um, feel free to reach out if you're interested in becoming a uh, data analyst, if you're interested in, uh, in learning more about how to start up an, ac an academic program, uh, or a consortium uh, in your community uh, to upskill um, the local industries. John, thank you so much.